Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to our first Feb Regency themed video. I wanted to make some videos that were themed around Feb Regency this year and I wasn't really sure where to start and what to do, but I thought I could start us off with something that I really enjoy about the Regency period and that is poetry. These are some of my current favorites. I won't say that they are my favorites of all time because I certainly have a lot more to explore in terms of poetry of this period. And I have a lot of poets in particular that I need to explore, some new names. Uh, so essentially what I'm gonna be talking about today are all of the big names of the period, uh, except for William Blake, who I unfortunately have yet to delve into. But so we're gonna go through some of the big ones here today. And we're really gonna go in no particular order. I'm not gonna rank these poems. Uh, some of them are big names. Some of them are a little bit lesser known. The first one we'll talk about is ranked. It is absolutely my favorite poem of the period. And it is in fact my third favorite epic poem, which is really saying something because I'm quite fond of epic poetry and I really should do a video all about my favorite epic poetry. Uh, but this is definitely top three for me. My top two are of course, number one, Dante's Divine Comedy. My second favorite epic poem of all time is G.K. Chesterton's Ballad of the White Horse. And I sometimes think Ballad of the White Horse is my favorite, but at any rate, we're not here to talk about either one of those. We are here to talk about Child Harold's Pilgrimage by Lord Byron. This is a really long epic poem. In some ways it doesn't even feel finished. It's just a very strange thing and I think it really only could have been written in the years of romanticism and the years of the Regency. It just seems to fit that time period so well in my opinion. Child Harold is one of the major works that Lord Byron is known for. I would say today, for the most part, many of the romantics don't get a lot of name recognition maybe other than Byron. And I don't think Byron is really known for his work. And I'm saying this from my kind of shelter position in that I never studied a romantic poet or a Regency era poet in school, high school, college, anything. I never came across them. And some of that might've been me. Uh, and some of that might have been the curriculum in the area where I grew up, but I never came across their work and studied it in school. It's something I discovered on my own. But Lord Byron is a name that I've always heard about, and I think I went into Lord Byron assuming that since I knew so much about his personal life and that that's really overshadowed his work in the modern day, I assumed his work was probably not going to be all that great. Who was made a fool of? Me, because his work is incredible. I actually think right now Byron is my favorite of the romantic poets purely because of Child Harold. Some of his other stuff doesn't really measure up against his contemporaries and against uh, some of the poets who were working prior to him. But Child Harold is easily the best thing that was written in the span between 1810 and 1820. I'm sorry. I'm saying that in a decade where Jane Austen was working. I'm saying that in a decade where Frankenstein was published. I truly believe <laughs> that Child Harold is the best thing that came out of that decade, for me anyway. And Child Harold is an epic poem that's told in four cantos, and it's essentially about a character called Harold uh, who goes on some travels and he's really very emo. Child Harold is essentially the first instance of what you might call a Byronic hero in fiction. And a lot of people, when this was being published, it was published across many years, I think 1812 to 1818. And many people thought Child Harold was a stand-in for Byron and that the entire poem was semi-autobiographical. At the time, Byron was pretty staunchly against that and said, Child Harold is a character. He is nothing like me. Of course, if you know anything about Lord Byron, when you read this poem, Harold will feel very, very familiar to you. So I think he was being, he was protesting a bit too much, let's just say. There are certainly shades of Byron in Harold, whether he wanted to acknowledge them or not. But the story eventually morphs from being so much about Harold and his kind of emo progression through life uh, into really just discussing things that Byron saw on his own travels. So the first two cantos, I would say, focus pretty much primarily on Harold, uh, while also being against the backdrop of some really gorgeous, stunning scenery that Byron himself had also visited. Cantos three and four 
are really more about the places than they are about Harold. Uh, and Canto Four in particular is the reason why this is one of my favorite poems of all time. Canto Four is all about Italy. And I know I'm basic. When I hear Italy, I'm just a little bit already in love with it, you know? So Italy is a bit of a buzzword for me, but it's the fact that Byron gets what is so appealing about Italy for me personally. This really felt like a mind meld. I really felt like if I went back in time or if Byron came forward 200 years, he and I agree on quite a bit uh, about Italian history and about, in particular, uh, things like the Elgin Marbles, museums. I just genuinely think we could have had a pretty good discussion, though I don't really know that I would have liked Byron personally. But Child Harold is genuinely some of the most stunning poetry you will ever read. And I'm gonna read you a couple of passages. Here's how Canto Two ends. What is the worst of woes that wait on age? What stamps the wrinkle deeper on the brow? To view each loved one blotted from life's page and be alone on earth as I am now. Before the chastener humbly let me bow, o'er hearts divided and o'er hopes destroyed. Roll on vain days, full reckless may ye flow, since time hath reft to whatever my soul enjoyed and with the ills of eld mine earlier years alloyed. His words on Rome are just absolutely amazing to me. I could quote to you the entirety of everything that he says on Rome and it would not be enough. I mean, it really would not be enough, but here are a couple of my favorite stanzas. Arches on arches as it were that Rome, collecting the chief trophies of her line, would build up all her triumphs in one dome. Her Colosseum stands, the moonbeams shine, as twere its natural torches, for divine, should be the light which streams here to illume this long explored but still exhaustless mine of contemplation and the azure gloom of an Italian night where deep skies assume. Hues which have words and speak to ye of heaven floats o'er this vast and wondrous monument and shadows forth its glory. There is given unto the things of earth which time hath bent a spirit's feeling and where he hath lent his hand but broke his side there is power and magic in the ruined battlement for which the palace of the present hour must yield its pomp and wait till ages are its dower. O oh, time, the beautifier of the dead, adorner of the ruin, comforter, and only healer when the heart hath bled, time, the corrector where our judgments err, the test of truth, love, soul, philosopher, for all beside are sophists from thy thrift, which never loses, though it doth defer, time, the avenger, unto thee I lift, my hands and eyes and heart, and crave for thee a gift." Byron gets a lot of airplay because of his really scandalous personal life, but uh, we should be talking about him quite a bit more for some of his absolutely beautiful, beautiful poetry. Byron also has a really beautiful sort of epic poem in the style of Tasso, I believe, uh, that's called The Prophecy of Dante. That is not included in my edition, and I have yet to find an edition that includes it, which is unfortunate because it is absolutely stunning. And it's essentially like Byron having a conversation with Dante and Dante having a prophecy of what the future will hold and how he will become famous and knowing that his name will live on. It is stunning. It was written when Lord Byron lived in Ravenna, which is where Dante died. Uh, and so I just feel a kindred spirit with Byron, which feels weird to say. Uh, but in many ways, I feel like Lord Byron and I appreciate the same things and we're into the same things. And so I just feel as though Byron and I really get on when I read his work. I don't know that personally, he and I would have got on. A poet that I do feel like, weirdly enough, I feel like personally I really would have gotten on with Shelley. Part of this is largely due to the fact that I'm obsessed with Mary Shelley. And when I read my first biography of her, I was just so with Mary in the moment that I think I fell a little bit in love with Percy Shelley at just the same moment that she did. And so even though I recognize Shelley did a lot of horrible, terrible things, and that he was specifically really bad to Mary on occasion, uh, I still feel the pull to him that I think 
she felt. So you really can't take me objectively because on a certain level, I have a bit of a crush on Percy Shelley. <laughs> so some of that is kind of wound up in how I interpret his work and how I read his poetry. But my favorite work of his is I think one of his most famous works and is I think what probably most people would say is his best and that is Adonais. Adonais was written after John Keats died. The name Adonais is kind of a play on Adonis, who is a figure from Greek myth who got a really incredible elegy. Uh, and so that's kind of what Shelley's playing with. And instead of directly calling to Keats, he calls him Adonais, which I think is really really beautiful and is probably something that Keats would have appreciated. Shelley had a really interesting relationship with Keats to my understanding in that they kind of knew each other but not very well. And Shelley kind of in a way insulted Keats when they first met, kind of saying, hey, you might sell better if you did something like this. And Keats is somebody who is pretty famously uh, sensitive to criticism. And I think he took that in the wrong way. Shelley really believed he was trying to help him. Shelley had a really blunt manner uh, and kind of just came out and said what he meant. And I don't think that Keats really appreciated that. And so while Keats was living, they weren't really all that close, but Shelley really admired his work. Uh, and when Shelley died, he had a book of Keats's poems in his jacket pocket. And so he really loved Keats. And so he wrote this in honor of Keats. And so it's a really interesting poem that uh, kind of meditates on death and on mourning. And mourning someone that you know, yes, but mourning someone that you know maybe in a parasocial sense. I think we might say that today uh, in that someone who had a real effect on you, maybe their art really had an effect on you, but you didn't really know them. And I kind of view this as maybe our relationship with certain celebrities and sometimes a certain celebrity's death hits you kind of hard. For me, that was Alex Trebek, who was the host of Jeopardy. That was one that really felt like I lost somebody I knew. For the most part, celebrities feel very distant from you. Uh, but some celebrities have been in your life, like their art has been in your life and has really impacted you personally. Musicians do this for a lot of people. Uh, and so that's kind of the lens through which I view Adonais now. But for Shelley, it's not just about mourning for Keats. It's that mourning Keats triggers him to remember uh, his son that died, his children that have died, and some of the relationship that he had with Mary that's gone by the wayside because she's changed so much since the death of their children. Uh, and maybe a dying way of life, a dying art form. There's a lot in here that Shelley mourns. Uh, and I think it's just a really, really beautiful, stunning poem. It's such a wonderful elegy for Keats. And I think it's also a really stunning elegy for Shelley. This is one of the last things that he wrote. And I just think this is his best work. It's really, really beautiful. There's like this lovely description of the great poets of old greeting Keats when he moves on, of Milton, Homer, and Dante kind of welcoming him into the echelons of great poets and it kind of is reminiscent of Dante because uh, in the Divine Comedy Dante interacts with all of his favorite poets and his favorite poets are like hey you're one of us now and so I think this is also something that Keats would have loved but there's just really beautiful imagery around the city of Rome Rome being a city where you you go to die but that you live forever in the eternal city of Rome it's just a really beautiful poem and I think it's very very moving and so you should read it when you are prepared to be a little bit emotional. Uh, because I think this makes you think of people that you've mourned in your own life, and maybe not even just people, but things that have gone away, things that have changed. Maybe the transition from child to adulthood. That's kind of also touched on in this poem, and that is something that I think many of us mourn, uh, is when we transition into adulthood. This is just a stunningly beautiful poem, and I highly recommend it. I could go on about it for days and days. Uh, but Adonais is one of my favorites. I read it last year, I believe on the bicentennial of its publication, which was really, really special. Uh, so that is one that I definitely highly recommend. With Shelley, there is also, of course, Queen Mab. Queen Mab was one of the first things that I read by Percy Shelley, and I don't think I was prepared for it. I don't think it should have been my first longer work by him because it is really densely written. It's very philosophical. There's a lot going on on the surface, but there's also a lot happening 
uh, kind of an interpretation underneath the language, which I think is probably the most interesting aspect of Queen Mab. I think it's a really beautiful poem, but it is one that I don't feel like I truly understood when I first read it. So that's one that I would really like to reread. Ozymandias is another of Shelley's most famous poems. It is insane. It's just so, so good. I think Shelley was inspired to write this when he looked at an Egyptian monument at the British Museum. It's just a really amazing poem and it's so short I can read it to you. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. A recent favorite of mine uh, is the Song of Apollo and the Song of Pan, which Percy wrote for Mary. Uh, so Mary Shelley intended to publish this play, I believe it was, about King Midas. And in it, she was retelling the myth of kind of a competition of song between the god Pan and Apollo. And Apollo is, of course, the god of poetry. Uh, and so he wins, I believe. And thus, by default, Apollo's poem is a little bit more classically structured and that appeals a bit more to me, but Pan's is appropriately chaotic and I just really like it. I like how different they are, but that you can feel as though these two pieces were meant to go together. There's a lot of Shelley in the Apollo poem, I think. Uh, there's a lot of Shelley in most of his poetry, uh, which I really like. I always feel as though I'm having a conversation with Shelley or with Byron, actually. I always feel like I'm having a conversation with them when I read their work. Next, let's talk about Keats. Uh, this is the last of the second generation, and I much prefer the second generation of romantic poets to the first. Uh, this is a really interesting thing to me, and I kind of discovered it when I did a poetry night with the other hosts of Feb Regency, which I think might be out now on Emma, the Bookish Princess's channel, if you haven't yet seen it. But I was just thinking a lot when everyone was reading their poems and the poems that they picked, just how different the two generations were. Wordsworth, Coleridge, Blake versus Keats, Shelley, Byron. Keats, Shelley, and Byron are far more concerned with architecture and with history, in my opinion, whereas the earlier poets are far more concerned with nature. Nature really colors their writing. But when I'm reading Byron, Shelley, Keats, to me, they're not so much nature focused, though there is a lot of really wonderful nature imagery in a lot of their poetry. I think they are more interested in kind of man-made nature, if that makes sense. Man-made architecture, uh, history coming through the ages in architecture, which is more my vibe. Uh, I'm not really a nature kind of girl, but I absolutely am uh, an antique architecture kind of girl. And so there's something that really appeals to me personally in Keats, Shelley, and Byron that is not there for me with Coleridge and Wordsworth thus far. I haven't read everything by them, so I'm, I'm waiting for the time when they will get me. I know that that will come and I will enter my obsession with Wordsworth and Coleridge eventually. But for Keats, a lot of people like to talk up the odes. Uh, so he has Ode on a Grecian Urn. He has uh, Ode to a Nightingale. My favorite ode is the Ode on Melancholy, which is just a really stunning, sad poem. And apparently I must really like a sad poem I'm discovering through this list. One I forgot with Shelley is the Ode on a West Wind, but that's another of my favorites of Shelley's. I really just like everything by Shelley. But in terms of the Odes of Keats, I really like the Ode on Melancholy. And the Ode on Melancholy is something that makes me think a lot about Keats and the difference between my relationship with Keats to my relationship with Shelley and Byron. I feel like I know Shelley and Byron on a personal level, maybe Byron on a professional level, Shelley on a personal level and their work is something I'm in conversation with. I'm often writing in the margins, writing my own thoughts, disagreeing with them or agreeing with them, and basically just talking with them uh, across 200 years. Keats's poetry feels so personal to me. 
as in personal to him, that it feels sometimes a little bit awkward for me to be reading as I often feel as though I'm reading his inner thoughts. I feel like I'm reading his diary. And sometimes I don't really feel like it's appropriate to be reading his poetry. It just feels so, so personal, and so introspective in a way that Shelley's and Byron's don't. Shelley and Byron feel very outward facing. They're wanting to share their opinions with everyone. Keats is like, I don't, really care if you agree with me or not, but these are my opinions and really I'm writing to record what I'm feeling, not necessarily to have a conversation with you, uh, which might be why Keats struggled in his own lifetime to be popular. But that is a bit of my, my struggle with Keats. I really, really like him. And in a weird way, it makes me feel as though I know Keats better. When I read his work, I feel like I know Keats personally in a way that I don't know Shelley or Byron. I feel like Shelley, we could categorize as a good friend. Byron is maybe somebody on an academic level I don't know all that well personally, don't care to know all that personally, but we can have really good, introspective, intelligent conversation about things. Keats, to me, is almost like a family member, somebody that you just know intimate details about, whether you want to know them or not. Keats is just very upfront with his emotions and his work for me. And that can be kind of uncomfortable. It can be kind of strange, uh, but I really like it. And apparently it works very well for a lot of people because I would say of everyone I'm gonna talk about today, Keats is the most popular poet uh, of this time period. He has remained continuously popular. The Ode to Melancholy too also really shows um, his relationship with sadness and depression because Keats, had uh, tuberculosis, he had consumption is what they would have called it at the time. Uh, and so I feel as though for a very long time, he lived with one foot on the other side, knew that was coming, knew he was gonna walk through that door probably very soon. And so that colors quite a bit of his work to me in a really interesting way, making peace with death, making peace with loved ones, knowing that you will die. Uh, there's just a really beautiful and melancholy tone to a lot of his work that I don't think will work well for everybody, but I just think is so achingly beautiful in a way. And it makes you really think and wonder about your relationship with death, mortality, being remembered, because Keats was pretty sure he would never be remembered. And look at us now. Uh, it's 200 years on, there was a massive bicentennial in his honor last year, and I doubt he could ever have fathomed that. He just so believed that he was not gonna be worthy of anything, that he was not gonna be worth anything, that his work would never be remembered, and that his work really wasn't all that great, uh, which is a real shame. And you can feel that in some of these poems that he's writing it and thinking, this isn't good, and why are you reading it? Uh, which is just kind of funny in a way, but is also really, really sad. There's a lot about Keats that is sad, but there's a lot about Keats that's also really inspiring and really viscerally angry. Uh, so another of my favorite, favorite poems is his poem about the Elgin marbles, uh, which is so interesting because it also is dealing with uh, thinking about your mortality and looking at something that is so old and knowing you know, it's 10 times as old as you are, and it'll be here long after you're gone. Uh, but there's also this kind of interesting undertone tying in the history of Greece and the history of the Elgin marbles coming uh, to the British Museum and British imperialism and British imperialism as opposed to mortality. And so there's often a really biting undercurrent in some of Keats's poems too, which I really like. I feel like there was some sass in his poem on the Elgin marbles. I recognize that I just really apparently like Apollo, but uh, another of my favorite of Keats's poems is his Ode to Apollo, which is one of the first things he wrote. And it's written in such a strange meter that it makes it very hard to read and very hard to figure out. But I just think it's so beautiful. Apparently I like Apollo. Maybe Apollo is my favorite Greek god, but I think a lot of it is that Apollo is the god of poetry, and so he serves as a muse to a lot of the poets of this time period. And so the poetry about him is just really stunning. And all of the Greek-inspired poetry is really stunning. Prometheus Unbound, the play by Percy Shelley. Prometheus by Lord Byron. Prometheus was a favorite subject for the Romantics and in the Regency period in general, because there's... Uh, quite a bit of Prometheus in Frankenstein as well. But 
I just love Keats. Uh, I have so much more to discover with Keats. He's somebody that I'm taking very, very slowly uh, and that I am just going through one poem at a time and I am really, really loving it. Another of my favorite poets of this time period is Sir Walter Scott. Sir Walter Scott is now mostly known for being a novelist. The interesting thing is, in his own lifetime, he was mostly known for being a poet. And certainly during the Regency period, this was true. Uh, because Waverly, his first novel, was written anonymously, as were a lot of the novels at the time. Actually, I'd say most novels of the Regency period were originally published anonymously. But he was more widely known for his poetry, uh, particularly in the true decade of the Regency. Uh, and so it's really interesting that he just became more known for his novel writing. Of course, he kind of was instrumental in founding the genre of historical fiction, so maybe that's why. But his poetry is uh, nothing to sniff at. It's really, really great. I think of Sir Walter Scott as just really a palate cleanser for this period because I have so much fun reading him. His poetry, his novels, there's just such a wonderful, old, tiny, medieval quality to his writing. It makes me feel all the time as if I'm watching A Night's Tale. It is that joyful. One of my favorite poems of his is Lochinvar, which is a medieval inspired poem. A lot of his poems are medieval inspired. Uh, and there's just a real courtly romance, chivalry vibe to that. It rhymes, of course, which is one of the best things. Most of my favorite poems on this list are poems that rhyme. I'm a sucker for a rhyme. And I think it sometimes sounds like really low class when you say you enjoy poetry, but only if it rhymes, but that's me. If it doesn't rhyme, if it's blank verse, it's gonna take me a little bit. It's gonna take me a little bit, unless it is epic poetry. But if it is a short poem, why aren't you rhyming? Why aren't you rhyming? It's just a question. At any rate, Sir Walter Scott often rhymes, and I think it adds a little bit to the storybook quality of a lot of his writing. One of his big poems that I also really enjoy is Marmion, uh, which is beautiful just absolutely beautiful. Uh, but one of my favorite poems, probably my favorite poem of his actually, is Harold the Dauntless, which is about a Viking warrior. Need I say more? <laughs> uh, that's just totally my vibe. And of course, it would be Sir Walter Scott who would write a long poem about a Viking warrior. It's just so beautiful. The imagery in this poem, "'Tis merry in Greenwood, thus runs the old lay in the gladsome month of lively May." When the wild bird's song on stem and spray invites to forest bower, then rears the ash his airy crest, then shines the birch in silver vest, and the beech in glistening leaves is dressed, and dark between shows the oak's proud breast, like a chieftain's frowning tower. Though a thousand branches join their screen, yet the broken sunbeams glance between, and tip the leaves with lighter green, with brighter tints the flower. Dull is the heart that loves not then, the deep recess of the wildwood glen, where roe and red deer find sheltering den when the sun is in his power. And then about Harold himself, the main character of the poem, uh, they say, answered good Eustace, a canon old. Harold is tameless and furious and bold. Ever renowned blows a note of fame and a note of fear when she sounds his name. Ooh, the sun's going down, so I need to finish up quickly. But uh, Sir Walter Scott is a poet that I absolutely have so much more to discover. Uh, and so I'm really excited to read more from him because what I've read so far has just been an utter delight. Uh, I think he is so much fun to read. His novels, his poetry, everything is just really joyful and fairy tale like And it's also just really introspective and in how it interacts with history and how he very much wants you to remember history and to remember the fact that history is why you are the way you are today. The present is the present because of the past. Uh, that's definitely Sir Walter Scott's motto and it's one that I really appreciate. Okay, I'm moving through quite quickly. For Samuel Taylor Coleridge, I love Christabel. I've loved a lot of Coleridge, but a lot of them are shorter poems that don't have much name recognition. Christabel is one of his longer poems that I think is really, really good. Uh, and it's very vampiric and gothic in nature in a similar way to The Rime of the Ancient Mariner, which is another of my favorites of his. That's probably his most famous one. And I think everyone loves it for good reason. It's just really, really good. Uh, there's often 
also a story-like quality to Coleridge, in my opinion, in that it seems like he is sometimes telling you, in these longer poems in particular, that he is telling you a story that has been told many, many times before, and you are just getting his interpretation of events, which I think is really valuable and really interesting and adds a really cheeky quality to his writing that the other poets of this time period don't have. Almost more than his poetry though, I'm really interested in getting into Samuel Taylor Coleridge's prose, uh, but specifically in terms of poetry anyway, I'm really interested in reading Lyrical Ballads, which was a collaborative work between him and William Wordsworth. So that's definitely one that I would like to try, uh, although I know it's quite long, but Coleridge is one that I have just barely gotten to know, and I feel like I will really like him as I continue to read more from him. Last but not least, we have William Wordsworth. Uh, my favorite poem by William Wordsworth <laughs> is a really lesser known poem, and it does in fact come from uh, lyrical ballads with Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And it is a fragment, it is a poem that he did not finish, and it's called The Danish Boy. And it's about a Viking warrior haunting a fen, haunting the heath, haunting the moors. It's just incredible. It doesn't get any better than that, really. Like, that's me in poetry form. He was really speaking to me on a deep level uh, with that poem. But I've liked a lot of his more well-known poems as well. The Daffodils poem in particular, I think is just really, really stunning. Uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge are more interested in nature, I would say, than the later generation. Uh, and so there's a lot of really beautiful imagery in his poetry that I really like, but a lot of what I've discovered from William Wordsworth thus far has been in blank verse, which is a bit more of a struggle for me than something that is maybe a rhymed couplet or it's in a particular meter uh, because that's just harder for me as a poetry reader and it takes a little bit more work for me uh, because even when something doesn't rhyme, if it's in a particular meter, it has a flow to it that I really like. I always seem to struggle finding out what meter William Wordsworth is gonna go with this time, uh, particularly in his earlier works, because I have been trying to work my way through all of the Romantic poets chronologically. I don't know if that's been to my benefit or to their benefit at all, uh, because for me, with William Wordsworth and Coleridge, I'm still stuck very early on uh, in their careers, and with William Wordsworth in particular, that's an interesting thing to say because he was an incredibly long-lived man, but he also was somebody that just worked for a really long time. And the poetry from his early career is vastly different from the poetry that he wrote later in life because he, of course, went through so many different changes. Of his longer works, I really like Peter Bell. I think that will probably come as no shock given what I've said some of my other favorites are, but I really like Peter Bell. Uh, for me, I like Wordsworth and I like Coleridge and I like Sir Walter Scott. They have not entered the upper echelons of favorites yet for me, and I think they will. I just think I need to find the right thing by them. So I would love to know down below if you have read any of these poems, if you have a favorite poem from the Regency era, uh, and if you have a favorite poet from the Regency era. There are so many poets that I have yet to explore, uh, some that time has essentially forgot. Uh, Cooper is one that I just think is really interesting. Uh, Emma the Bookish Princess mentioned him as Jane Austen, favorite poet. And he is somebody who I genuinely have never heard anything about except through Jane Austen. Uh, so I'm really excited to get into him, to get into John Clare, uh, and to read more from my favorites. I'm trying to savor them. I, I don't want to blow through them and read everything they have and then be left with nothing new to discover. Uh, but for right now, I think Byron is my favorite purely because of Child Harold's Pilgrimage. In terms of volume, in terms of the amount of things that I have genuinely loved, Shelley is my favorite. But I would love to hear about all of your favorites down below. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.